not going to have any of that beating people up. You know, we, we, we believe in redemption and people being forgiven for past sins and moving forward. So that's what we're going to do. Now, uh, I've got a couple things I want to tell you. I, I am so thrilled about the debate this week. Are you? <laughs> Romney was going to be prepared, and he was. One of my favorite sayings is, chance favors the prepared mind. Uh, do you know who said that? Louis Pasteur. He was a great French scientist, and Louis Pasteur was one of the few things that France got right. <laughs> he also said, when you work seven days a week, 14 hours a day, you know what? You get lucky. <laughs> French citizens would be truly free today, and France a much prosperous, more prosperous nation, if they had heeded this scholar's advice. So guess what happened this week? Instead of playing golf and going on vacation and constant campaigning when he was should be studying, Mitt Romney prepared his mind and he worked hard. And in the first debate, Mitt Romney cleaned Obama's clock. So I'm going to hit about five, five of my favorite lines from the debate. The first one, what things would I cut from spending? Well, first of all, I'll eliminate all programs by this test. If they don't pass it, this, this question, is the program so critical it's worth borrowing money from China to pay for it? And if not, I'll get rid of it, and Obamacare is on my list. <laughs> Mr. President, you're entitled as the president to your own house and your air own airplane, but you're not entitled to the facts, your own facts. I'm sorry, Jim, I'm going to stop the subsidy to PBS. I like PBS. I love Big Bird, and I actually like you, Jim, but I'm not willing to keep borrowing money from China to pay for it. And let me just say this. You know what? There is nowhere in the United States Constitution that it gives the federal government the authority to give money to PBS in the first place. Right? Patriots, we know that the very first test to decide on what you should cut should be do you find explicit instruction in the U.S. Constitution to do it. And we're not talking about the elasticized general welfare clause either. We're talking about getting the federal government back inside a constitution-sized box. It's not just whether or not we have to borrow money from China, but let's just say this, Mitt's getting there. I will not reduce the share paid by high-income individuals. I know that you and your running mate keep saying that, Mr. President, and I know it's a popular thing to say with a lot of people, but it's just not the case. Look, I've got five boys. I'm used to people saying something that's not always true, and they just keep on repeating it, ultimately hoping I'll believe it, but that's not the case, all right? And you know, President Obama just stood there, he didn't realize that. <laughs> Mitt Romney had just caught him, told him he was a liar but with a smile on his face. <laughs> And last, I've been in business for 25 years. I have no idea what you're talking about, Mr. President. Maybe I need to get a new accountant, but the idea you get a break for shipping jobs overseas is simply not the case. So I thought he did a great job. Now, a very quick and important history lesson that talks that feeds into our speaker today. Our speaker today is the president and CFO of the Frederick Douglass Society. Frederick Douglass was an American social reformer, an orator, a writer, a statesman, and a former slave. After escaping from slavery, Douglass became a leader of the abolitionist movement and came to agree that the United States Constitution was an anti-slavery document. Frederick Douglass instinctively knew that the key to real liberty is knowledge. He was initially taught the alphabet by a plantation owner's wife at a time when it was a crime to teach a slave to read in the state of Maryland. Douglas succeeded in learning to read from the white children in his neighborhood, 
and by observing the writings of men with whom he worked. Once Douglas learned to read, he became a self-taught scholar, and I mean a scholar. He was a voracious reader. He read newspapers, political writings, and he taught other slaves how to read the New Testament, the book of freedom. This is why it is so important for all of us to push for bold and unrelenting reforms in public education today because children of all races need to know how to read and how to think for themselves. They are being groomed now to be sheep and they are waiting for the great government master to tell them what to believe, what to think, and above all, to be grateful for master government's handouts. That's wrong. It's morally wrong, folks. And that's why we work as hard as we do to combat this in our own community with Tyler ISD. And before too long, we'll be announcing a new coalition of people who are joining with us to address the issues of the lack of academics and academic uh, rigor and discipline in our schools. So by the way, this week, when you hear about another government handout program called Obama Phones, I want you to remember that it, Obama did not originate that program. They really should be called George W. Bush Phones, okay? So we need to remember that we have big, spending, compassionate conservatives on both sides of the aisle who ignore the Constitution and put government on a course that's outside its constitutional bounds. Finally, this is one of the wisest sayings I could find of Federal, Frederick Douglass, and he had many. I will unite with anybody to do the right thing and with nobody to do the wrong thing. That's important. Think about that. <laughs> Stacy Swim, our speaker today, is the president and CFO of Frederick Douglass Society. Stacy is a dynamic and inspirational national speaker, and he is a dedicated public servant. He is a current member and spokesperson for Project 21, the nation's largest network of black conservatives. Stacy is a board member for the Michigan Right to Work Coalition and is a 2011 graduate of the Henry Marsh Institute of Public Policy and a 2009 graduate of the Great Lakes Bay Region African American Leadership Training Institute. Stacy is host of Contagious Transformation, an online political commentary, and is a noted journalist. Stacy's motto, which he has on his voicemail, is there are no permanent boundaries around us that we do not place around ourselves. Today, he's going to give you a message called Concede Nothing. Stacy Swing. Good afternoon, fellow freedom fighters. They told me I was coming to a place where people love liberty. Am I in the right place today? Yes, sir. I can't tell because you're still in your chairs. Am I in the right place? Do you love liberty here in Tyler, Texas? Yes. How many of you know that America is the greatest place in the world? I mean, you know that we're blessed to be Americans. Yes. Before we get started, I just want to take a moment to remember our soldiers who serve us abroad and around the United States of America. Let's give a hand for our United States military. I believe they're the most underpaid, underappreciated people in the world. And I came to Texas actually because my brother lives here in Texas. My brother, uh, this is his second day as a civilian after serving our country faithfully for 24 years. 
So I came down here to surprise him with a surprise retirement party, and boy, was he surprised. Uh, my brother's the kind of person, he didn't, he didn't like a lot of fanfare, he didn't like crowds, and you know, he told me he's accustomed to being in situations where you know, he's in a tank or he's in a situation where soldiers are lined up and you know, everybody's protecting in front of him, beside him, and, and back of him. He's not used to crowds, and so had he known I was doing it, he wouldn't have showed up. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm, I'm proud of my brother, I'm proud of the United States military, and uh, to the president, uh, you know, shame on him for trying to weaken our United States military. You agree with me that? something I want to ask you to repeat after me since we're in a church we're gonna to go to church today. Is that okay I thought about that when I came to the door I said I can preach today <laughs> I mean it, it makes a difference because sometimes I find myself in secular situations and uh, you know not everybody's as excited about God as you and I are do you know that today yes. if you don't believe me all you had to do was watch the Democrat convention <laughs> that's all you had to do I've never seen people boo God I've seen them boo the Dallas Cowboys. Not me, though. I'm a cowboy diehard. How about that? I actually lived here in Corpus Christi for three years, by the way, uh, out there when my father was stationed in the Air Station. But anyway, we, I want to I ask you to repeat something after me, and then we're going to drive this point home. Now, in church where I come from, these uh, more charismatic churches, we do that call and catch and, and all that stuff. So I'm going to ask you to repeat these two words after me. Concede. Oh, that wasn't too good. That wasn't too good. We're going to act like we're in the black church today, y'all. How about that? <laughs> we'll try that one more time. Concede. Concede. That's what I'm talking about. Nothing. Nothing. Concede. Concede. Nothing. Nothing. That's what we're going to talk about. Conceding nothing. How many of you know that we are under attack from every direction? We are under attack from jihadists, from stealth jihadists in this nation. Does, anybody, does everybody know what that is? That means that we have an Islamic movement yes. in a very subtle way that's trying to seize our freedom right here in America. How many of you know that today? Yes. All right, take it seriously. So that's just one. But then how many of you know that we've been under attack from socialists for over 100 years? Yes. Okay? Some folks act like President Obama came along and started the birth of socialism. Oh no, he's simply the messiah of all things socialists. Because there was an inroad in place long before he got, got in the position to do the things he's doing. Before he became president, we had practically hundreds of members. We still have hundreds of members of Congress who are socialists. And, no, and let nobody tell you I think that we've got what I call stealth socialists, some of them masked as Republicans. Yes. Believe that. I have identified no less than 50 to 58 Republicans in the House of Representatives who I think are socialists. Why do I say that? Because they're constantly voting for big government. They're constantly voting for big labor. They're constantly voting socialism and education. All you have to do is check out the voting record. So I don't care what your title is. I don't care what you say you are. I want to know how are you voting. That tells me more about what you believe than what you say. So we are under attack at all sides. The great President Ronald Reagan said it. We're only one generation removed from losing our freedom. And let me tell you something. It's going to take more of us, more from us, that at any time in my lifetime, if we're going to sustain and hold on to our freedom, it means that we're going to finally have to do something different. Like stop preaching to the choir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Stop talking to people who already know what we know. When I say concede nothing, why do I say that? Because I'm saying when you leave here today, you have to go to these liberal leading communities, places typically where we don't hang out. Whether they be predominantly black or Hispanic or whatever they are, liberal leading communities. That's where you have to start spending your time. How many of you know, let's face it, the reason why we got in this mess to begin with is because we've conceded these demographics for decades. We all did what was comfortable for us. We did what was easy for us. You know, most of us are homogeneous. That means we tend to hang with people who are like us. That's what we do. It's comfortable. 
But that, what, what that means is that we're all responsible in some shape, form, or fashion for this mess that we're in. We, by, by virtue of being uninvolved with communities that don't think like us, sometimes communities that don't look like us, because that's what happens. Dr. King says Sunday is the most segregated day in America. I travel around the country and I'm telling you, that's still the truth. We're not in the same place, but sometimes we allow our false assumptions and liberal ideologies and liberal media to cause us to keep barriers around us that really don't make any sense. How many of you agree with that today? Yeah. Amen. And so I want you to know something about me. The most important thing I can tell you about Stacey Swift today is that I am an unhyphenated American. You understand what that means? So one of the things that we have to do is we have to tear down these walls. One thing liberals love to do, they love to play that race card. I mean, it's not just black liberals, it's all liberals. First thing they say, racism. You know, you can talk about voter ID, racism. You talk about anything, racism. They want to divide us, keep us divided along ethnic lines. And I say the word ethnic because how many of you know there's only one race and that's the human race? How many of you know that too? There is no such thing. See, liberals came up with that line, black race, white race. I don't know what they're talking about. I belong to the human race. And quite frankly, the word race truly is a misnomer. Because at the end of the day, we're all creation, creations of God. I love the fact that we are in church, because I can tell you that God, I don't believe, is pleased with our foolishness. At the end of the day, socialism is an anti-God ideology. Okay? It is an anti-God ideology. So when I say concede nothing, I'm saying I'm tired of talking to people and as I travel who have given me excuses as to why they can't get out into certain communities and take our message of truth. Don't you know that Jesus told the disciples to take ye the gospel into all the four corners of the earth? He sent the disciples out by twos, I think it was 72 of them, told them to knock on every door, leave no stone uncovered. Now, when I say that, people say, well, Stacey, you're getting confused. You're talking about the church, and you're talking about religion, and that's got nothing to do with politics. I say, you got this twisted, sir. I am a Christian conservative, and what that means is that I am a conservative because I am a Christian. Yes. What that also means is that we have a responsibility to juxtapose our Christian principles with political practices. So since Jesus told the disciples to go ye into the corners of the earth and take the gospel to every household, the same message applies to conservatives who are Christians, and we all here are Christians. That means that you take this message of limited government, of individual responsibility, of strong defense, of free market, of the things that we know, the constitutional principles that Miss Fleming talked about. We have to go to every door, knock on every door, and ask them, do you understand the Constitution? Do you want to be free? Do you want lower taxes? Many of these folks don't know the answer to these questions. They only have the socialist liberal narrative that's been prominent in their communities their entire lives. And unless you and I stop conceding these communities to liberalism, whether it be through their liberal educational systems, whether it be through their liberal organizations, whether it be through liberal media, unless we stop conceding these communities, it's just, it's just going to go worse, get worse, keep continuing on to generation to generation, and everybody's gonna do what we've been doing, which is to play that false blame game. I don't know about you, but God told the disciple, actually he told the prophet, he said, who will go for me? And the prophet said, send me, Lord, I'll go. I don't know about you, but I'm willing to go anywhere to fight for freedom today for my children and my children's children. What about you? So there's three things that we really need. And I talked about this yesterday. Frequency, relevancy, and sincerity. Frequency means we just can't keep showing up in communities two weeks, three weeks, two months before the election. How many of you know that? Because everybody wants to talk about you know, black Americans and well, they voted what 96%. For the president, but how many of you know? How many of you know that in 2008, 95 percent 
of Native Americans also voted for Barack Obama. Anybody knew that? 95%. How many knew that almost 70% of Hispanic Americans voted for President Obama in 2008? How many knew that almost 65% of Asian Americans voted for Barack Obama in 2008? How many knew that? Isn't that amazing? And that's been consistent. So why are all these supposedly minority voting blocks, if you will, continually voting liberalism when the truth is socialism has always been particularly burdensome to the poor? I don't know who came up with this false notion that uh, redistribution is friendly to poor people because redistribution actually hurts poor people. I've never seen a socialist nation in my lifetime that has a thriving poor community. What they have is a caste system. What they have is a system where the poor get poor and the rich are the people in the government. There is no middle class in a socialist nation. And it gets worse than communist nations. So why is it that all of these demographics are continually voting for liberal representatives, be it the president or anyone else? It's because we're not doing our job. They are, yes, they're responsible for their choices, but how many of you know that to whom much is given, much is required? How many of you know that? God didn't, I don't know about you, but I didn't come out of my mother's womb a hardcore conservative. I wish it was true, but it's not. I like to tell you that when I was 12, I knew all about Ronald Reagan and Abraham Lincoln, but I didn't. <laughs> I like to tell you when I was 16 that I knew all about Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington, and I knew all about the great black men in history who were Republicans after the uh, Civil War. I'd like to be able to tell you that, but if I told you that, I would be lying to you. So the truth is, I came to a revelation. And the Bible says that when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. When I was a child, hey, I thought like a lot of people did. You know, all oh, those Republicans are racist. I thought that too, okay? <laughs> I thought a lot of different things. And then I woke up and realized I must have been crazy. Because the truth is that the Republican Party actually emancipated slaves. How many of you know that? How many of you know that the Republican Party is the one that passed the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act? I didn't know those things when I was young. And I'm telling you something. Most people in liberal communities don't know these things either. When I go into liberal communities, they think, when I talk about Frederick Douglass, they say, oh, he was a Democrat. I said, oh, really? <laughs> and then I remind them of a quote from Frederick Douglass. He said that I am a Republican. I am a black died in the war Republican. And I never intend to belong to any other party except the party of freedom and progress. That is a quote from Frederick Douglass. So how is it that here in 2012, Nobody seems to know that. It's because we're not teaching that the way we should. How many of you have ever heard of David Barton? Anybody ever heard of David Barton? Okay. American history in black and white because he's done a great job in putting together uh, research about the black political history of the Republican Party. But guess what? Uh, in the South, uh, you folks, my brothers and sisters here, you get it. I see that kind of teaching uh, uh, you know, pro prominent down here. But unfortunately, it's not everywhere. So instead of just talking to each other about that kind of history, why not go out and do leaf drops? Are you talking about outreach? Why don't you take those leaf drops and go out into these urban communities and go to, and don't be afraid. And I'm gonna tell you something. I talked about frequency. Go out there all the time. When you first started this church, you know, you didn't just put up a church and, and open the door one Sunday and then close the doors and never open it again or close the doors and didn't open it again until the election season. You didn't do that. You opened, whoever founded this church, they opened the doors and they kept them open, didn't they? And they, keep, they kept preaching every Sunday. They probably had a Bible study every Wednesday or Tuesday. Probably had revivals. But they were frequently involved with preaching the gospel. How do you think that we're going to overcome socialism, stealth jihad, and all these things that are attacking our nation if we are infrequent and in taking these message 
messages and these principles and these values and our free market solutions to liberal leaning communities. I want to know how do you really believe we're going to change this thing if that's what we continue doing? You have to do something different. Relevancy. What do I mean when I say relevancy? I'm saying that I don't, first of all, I don't believe in pandering to folks. I want you to know that. Okay? I don't believe in pandering. But I do believe that we have to meet people where they are. You know, the, you know the Apostle Paul said that we have to be all things, all people? What that really means to me in terms of political practice is, look, okay, I, I travel, I'm here in, in Tyler, and you, don't, you know, we don't have automotive industry here in Tyler, do we? So it wouldn't do me any good to give you a speech about the automotive industry and, uh, and the uh, unions and the UAW because you don't have that here, do you? I first, if, so if I wanted to do outreach in Tyler, I'd have to at least to some extent come and talk to you here and have you teach me about your community and me understanding what's going on here. And as I learn from you a little bit about this community, then I can begin to translate my message of free market to your local community. Does that make sense to you? Yes. I'm not pandering to you, but I'm trying to understand something about you so that we can figure out how to apply free market solutions right here. Free market is free market to me, folks. Okay? Doesn't have black or white on it, just free market. But I at least have to talk to you and have a relationship with you and walk along a side of you so that I can understand what life looks like and feels like to you so that my message, therefore, is crafted in a way that makes sense to you. Not based upon the color of your skin, but just based upon your realities. Anybody agree with that? Yes. So frequency and relevancy is important. It's very important. That's, that's why relationship building is so important. Sincerity simply means, it doesn't mean that we're going to tell people what they hear, because I don't do that. I am not politically correct. I just want you to know that. Good. Okay? I'm not. That's why I got no friends. <laughs> <laughs> people just don't like me. I tell too much truth. They don't like that too much. You know, but I'm sincere in the sense that I love this country. And you know that if you really love God, I mean really love God, and you're serving from your heart, people can see that. You don't have to go out your way to tell them that. Just show up. That's all you have to do. I'm, I'm telling you, just I don't, I don't believe in conceding anything. I've, I've had some Republican groups in Michigan tell me, well, you know, say, see, we're just not going to go out in Detroit. And I tell them that's a colossal mistake. Sure, if you don't want to spend the kind of money in Detroit that you spend in Oakland County, which is an area which is very important to the election in Michigan and to this country because how many of you know that Governor Romney needs to win his home state of Michigan? How many of you know that? Yeah. Okay? But it's not going to happen. I'll tell you right now, it's not going to happen if we don't get out into Detroit and some of these communities where people keep making excuses. How many of you know you don't need color to reach color? How many of you know that? Oh, uh, some, some people don't know that, huh? Can I tell you a story about a little boy? Do you mind? Do you mind if I tell you a little story about a little boy? This little boy that grew up in a very humble situation. He was born into a very unusual situation, a broken home, if you will, in the sense that his mother had already had two kids, young girl having two children, not married, and uh, the, the father of this child was already married. Yeah, people out there committing adultery sometimes, don't they? So this woman has a child by a married man, decides that she didn't want to raise the child, so she gives the child over to the father and his wife who accepted the child because she couldn't have kids. Long story short, this child grew up in a very troubled situation because his father drank a little bit too much. And then he found out about this mother that he had out there someplace when he was about eight or nine and very confusing, but rather than being supportive of the child, people began to dismiss this child and somewhat abuse this child emotionally and mentally because they figured, hey, why is he asking about his mom? We're raising you pretty good. How many of you know adopted kids sometimes go through that? So this child, all of a sudden, his world was shattered. And everybody that he trusted, no longer did he trust, just like that. So this kid went from being sort of a nerdy child to a very troubled child because he was hurt. Maybe he was angry, he had nowhere to turn to. By the time this child was 12, this kid started getting in a lot of trouble, dropped out of school after the seventh grade. By the time this kid was 15 years old, this kid was in and out of jail. 
okay? By the time this kid was 25 years of age, he was looking at prison. He ended up going to jail. But something miraculous happened when this kid was about 25. He met a white police chief. This is a black kid, black young man. He met a white police chief who happened to be a conservative Republican. But he didn't tell this kid anything about his politics. He told this kid about someone all of you might know named Jesus Christ. And he loved this young man from his heart. And he tolerated the silly and stupid things this young man would say to him when he tried to witness to him. How many of you know that very often when we're trying to witness to people about our politics, they're not always going to receive it the first time we say something. So this young man was led to Christ by a police chief. And then later, this young man got out of jail and then he went on to be mentored by chamber leaders. Went on to find himself in a situation to where he was being mentored by conservative leaders in his state. He created his own business. This young man began mentoring people. He ended up winning a national award for his work with young people. This young man later read about a gentleman named Frederick Douglass and radically expanded his concepts. Next thing you know, he started speaking on conservative politics and this young man created the Frederick Douglass Society. This young man, ladies and gentlemen, is me. So I'm living proof that you don't need color to reach color. All you need is a sincere heart. How many of you have ever read a scripture in the Bible in Chronicles? It says, for the eyes of the Lord go to and fro the entire earth, seeking whose heart is sincere towards him, that he might show himself strong on his behalf. See, if you really love God, you know God, if you know him like you say you do, and you love him like you say you do, and you trust him like you say you do, how many of you know that if you're willing to go and do what you've never done, if you're willing to step out on faith and go into these liberal communities, if you're willing to challenge people regardless of whether they're black, white, Hispanic, if you're willing to take their ridiculous uh, uh, accusations against you, yes, they're going to call you racist. Yes, they're going to call you all these dirty names. But that's nothing because they crucified Jesus. They, took, they put the disciples on logs and cut them in half. How many of you know that? They, they, white Republicans were being hung in the South during, uh, after Reconstruction because they were fighting for liberty for blacks in the South. And Dixiecrats and liberals were lynching whites just like they were lynching blacks in the South, but yet blacks and whites stood side by side because they had a common faith in God. They trusted God to go out ahead of them and show themselves strong on their behalf. And yes, they lost their lives, but the Bible says that if you would love God even to the end of your life, he will reward you. He rewards your children's children. That's what made America strong. It's our common faith. How many of you are willing to stand up today and tomorrow and forevermore and recapture that common faith in God and trust God to go out and show himself strong on the behalf of our great republic and take back that which we've conceded for too long to liberals? How many of you are willing today to take that extra step? promised people I wouldn't keep them too long. I never keep that promise, by the way. <laughs> but really, we have to stop conceding based upon skin color, because that doesn't mean nothing. It doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't. Why should we be prideful and arrogant about something we had nothing to do with? I didn't have a choice of being born black. That was God's bright idea. Okay. You didn't have any choice as to what you looked like when you came into this world. What difference does it make? It doesn't. It doesn't make any difference. At the end of the day, the only thing that matters is the fact that we all are God's children. For those of us that believe, and for those of us that don't, then pray for them. But don't concede anything to them. Don't be afraid of them. Why should a child of God allow, to allow any devil in hell to walk on you and me? Why? Why should we be, why should a, a conservative be afraid of a liberal? Since when? Why should we? Aren't we the truth bearers? Aren't we truly the salt of the earth? Can God trust us to stand strong and stand tall? I say that too often he hasn't been able to trust us. That's how, how in the world did we get 
a two-year senator with no record that we could find that was relative, all of a sudden is the president of the United States? How in the world did that happen? Forget his skin color. I'm telling you, anybody. How, how do you get to be a two-year senator? with no record of free market and leading business and, you know, with a long history of Marxism and communism. Such, how do you get to be president? That happens because we let that happen. That happened because we stood on the sidelines, we were too busy. We took for granted this great freedom that we have in our republic. Do you know that? We took it for granted. And so now I'm saying that we've got to get out into these liberal leaning communities. Now I see you got runaway slave coming here to Tyler, Texas. How about that? Give C.L. Bryant a great hand for the work that they're doing. I'm just going to, I'm just going to touch base with just because how many of you have, how many of you have watched the trailer of Runaway Slave? Okay, you about to you're about to be in for a real treat. Sale Bryan is a good friend of mine, a mentor to me, and uh, so I'm very excited for you that he's coming. And understand the concept of Runaway Slave. Now, the context of the movie, he's talking about blacks in the movie, but how many of you know that slavery now transcends all ethnicities? How many know that right now we have economic slavery going on in our country? How many of you know that unions want to enslave our economy? How many of you know that? No, I'm not anti-union, don't get me wrong. I'm just anti-force unionism. Knock on wood, thank God for you, Texas is a right to work state, what about that? Well, I, am, I am a part of the Michigan Right to Work Coalition or Freedom to Work Coalition. We're trying to make Michigan the 24th right to work state in our great republic. But you are, you are in for a treat when you watch Runaway Slave. You're in for a real treat, I won't give it away. But I'll just tell you, when you watch it, understand that those things apply across the board, okay? Slavery, Frederick Douglass was someone who, and I'm, I'm, I'm really privileged to be friends with the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass, his name is Kenneth Morris. And he is the president and founder of an organization called the Frederick Douglass Family Foundation. The Frederick Douglass Family Foundation. What they do is they fight against human sex trafficking. How many of you know that human sex trafficking is a crisis even in America today? Yes. And they're doing a great job. And so anyway, I had Kenneth Morris on my radio show, Contagious Transformation, and then we talked for hours after the show. And he said something that I never forgot. He said, Stacey, you know, here's the thing. He said, Frederick Douglass, my great, great, great grandfather, was the kind of person that he really believed in fighting for those who didn't have a voice. And he reminded me how Frederick Douglass was the first black American to speak at the Women's Suffrage Conference. How many of you know that? He actually fought for women's rights too. So he wasn't just fighting for black people, okay? So his thing was, well, you know, slavery comes in many forms, but one thing for sure, slavery under any name is still slavery. Today, we have people in our country who don't really understand freedom. And so like Frederick Douglass, he said we have to resist, resist, resist. I say the same thing today. And runaway slave taps back into that concept of running away from these plantations. These plantations are not just black communities, but they're ideologies, ways of thinking, the orientation of our lifestyles that make us slaves to ignorance, slaves to fear, Slaves to liberalism, slaves to, con how many of you know that constitutional illiteracy is a major crisis in, in America today? I heard Ms. Fleming mention something that's very profound. She's right. The United States Congress was never given the authority by the Constitution of the United States of America to subsidize all these things that have our debt over $16 trillion. But you have people who I call weak need Republicans and liberals who will make excuses as to why they keep expanding government. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't personally want to see an individual mandate anywhere in this country. Well, some people will argue, well, those states' rights, well, why should the states have a right to violate the Constitution of the United States? How many of you know that individual mandates are no more than socialism? 
I don't care how it got there. The bottom line, if it's there, it's taking away the individual freedom of the American people. It limits your choices. It should not be allowed anywhere in our country. We shouldn't be talking about whether the states should implement a socialist concept, as far as I'm concerned. Okay? But because people are not constitutionally literate, and they don't really understand the Commerce Clause has already addressed this issue, then they would rationalize with you, some people, why this socialist no notion or concept is, is, is logical on a state level. I don't think so, folks. How many of you agree with me? <laughs> but we've conceded for so long. Now it's out of control. Same thing with education. I heard Ms. Fleming mention education. You want to talk about runaway slaves and slavery, how many of you know that school choice is a matter of urgency today? And how many of you know that the expansion of educational choices is one of the number one human rights, civil rights issues of our time? How many of you know that? And the interesting thing is now you've got the NAACP and other liberal organizations who would claim that somehow this is hurting public school education. They're lying to themselves and they're lying to you. Anything that promotes competition and that promotes quality and it gets it better, not worse. Okay? And it's interesting how they would say something like that when it was the NAACP that actually fought for school choice in the landmark, in the landmark uh, Brown versus Board of Education Act. They're the ones that actually started creating private schools and, and, and what we now call, what they used to call magnet schools, now they're charter schools. They fought for that until these teachers unions were created and until this out of, out, out of control federal cabinet we call the Board of Education was created, they would fight for that. How many of you know that the Board of Education to me is an anti-American socialist organization? <laughs> we gotta get rid of that. But we've conceded again. So now we got people across the country that don't know the difference between what's constitutional and, 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 and what's not. So how many of you, I want to wind this down, I want to know how many of you after today are going to, are, are you going to go out and keep preaching to the choir? Or are you going to go out, like Jesus told the disciples to do, and you're going to go out into these communities where maybe you thought you had, you had to have some black men or women to go out there. Maybe you thought that you didn't have enough Hispanics to go out there. Maybe you thought that you didn't have the right cultural understanding to go out there. Uh, don't you know that freedom is freedom is freedom and constitution is constitution is constitution? And don't you know that constitution doesn't have anything to do with culture? How many of you believe that? Yeah. Freedom is freedom. So how many of you after today are willing, when I come back here, I want to see a room with some Hispanics and blacks. If you got any Asians, I want to see them here too. And you can do it. You know why? Because all of you are truth bearers. You are the salt of the earth. This is an amazing group. You're just like the early church. Okay? They were just a small group of people. But they shook up the world because they had a common faith. And everywhere they went, my Bible tells me that people would say, wow. That person must have been walking with Jesus because something is different about them. Guess what? Something is different about each and every one of you in this room. Each and every one of you are special and you're unique. And how many of you know that God plus one is a majority? How many of you know that you have the advantage today? How many of you know that? You have the advantage. Don't fear. Please don't fear. Revelation says that the enemy uses accusations always uses accusations to try to derail believers. It says that they accused us before God day and night. They accused us before God day and night. But we overcame them by the word, by the blood of the Lamb, and the word of our testimony. We are going to overcome liberalism, folks, together. We're going to overcome jihad together. We're going to overcome these attacks on our republic together, we're going to do it against those accusations because we love God, we love country, we love family. And after today, I want to know that we are no longer going to concede nothing. If you're with me, stand to your feet today and let me hear you say, concede. Nothing. Concede. Nothing. God bless you and God bless America. So I think we...
I think we have some questions and answers. We have some cards. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about being back in Texas. It's been a, since 1980 since I've been in Texas, but it won't be that long before I come back. <laughs> It'll be that long before I come back. And I got to get me some boots while I'm down here. <laughs> My brother was telling me there's, some, there's a place here, a special place here where you get boots. I wouldn't know where to begin to look, but... Uh, I, I've seen some really nice looking boots. Where, where, where's that? They, they have one in Tyler? Yes. Okay, maybe I'll get some boots before I leave Tyler today. All right, we have a car? Do you get called the Uncle Tom in the black community? Do I get called Uncle Tom? That's like asking me am I black. <laughs> Man, I get called Uncle Tom, Uncle Ruckus, sellout. I had somebody actually had the audacity to inbox me on Facebook, actually happened, and said, you need to find a stiff tree and a long rope and hang yourself and sell out. Oh yeah, and put his name on it. How many of you know that liberalism is insanity? Yes. Yes. It's true. Oh yeah, I've had my car vandalized. I've lost income. I basically had to start all over again when I first got involved with conservative movement. Because I, 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 I thought, I think that I counted the cost but I don't know if I really saw how bad it was. I don't think I really wrapped my mind around what I was getting ready to face. And there were people who I stood side by side with them and their families who I thought we were friends. And I mean, just like that, those relationships were over. It was stunning. And in some cases, it was hurtful. Really, how many of you have lost friends because you stood up for truth? How many of you had family members turn their back on you because you stood up for truth? So I don't think that's just a black thing, do you? I don't think so. But to, to his point, yes, I've been called Uncle Tom. You know what I tell people when they call me Uncle Tom? I said, do me a favor, please buy the shirt, put that on there so I can wear it. <laughs> Let me know. Because if that's the best you got, you know, I say bring it on. What about you? Yeah. Can you just go door to door or connect with community leaders first? You know, Community leaders, of course, are gatekeepers. We know we, we all know gatekeepers, aren't they? Mm -hmm. But sure, you can you can give them a, what I call an olive branch and and and, and attempt to uh, invite them to your meetings and such. But I don't think that you need the permission of any so-called community leader to go out to these doors. I say that you go out there. Just Jesus didn't tell the disciples, "Look, I want you to go out to the Roman guards and uh, the local Roman leaders, and I want you to tell them that you're intending to go out and knock on doors and spread the gospel." I don't think did he say that? What did he tell them to do? He told them to go. So I, you know, you can reach out to those leaders if you want to, but don't worry about that. Do the mission. Do the mission. Okay? If you have identified potential partners or people who are already, sometimes there are people who are already in a community who are somewhat conservative, but they haven't had much of a support, and so they've been afraid to take a stand, they're out there too. You know? But if you go out into the community, you begin to identify them. But don't, don't let anybody hold you up from going and knocking on doors. Because I'm telling you, you you're going to get insulted. I'm telling you right now. Be prepared for that. That's okay. Just smile. Thank you, man. Thank you, sir. Keep going. Doesn't make any difference. As long as they don't put you up on a cross, you're good to go. <laughs> okay? You're good to go. Do you think Obama will try to start riots in this country before elections so he can declare martial law and stop the elections? I don't think, I don't think uh, necessarily that the president is going to uh, say something uh, with the intention to start that kind of thing, but I think there are many liberals who will, okay? I think uh, your, your Al Sharpton, your Jesse Jacksons, and you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, at, back in the day, Al Sharpton helped to start a riot in New York City. It was called the Crown, riot, Crown Heights riot where people were killed. How many of you ever heard that? Okay, because he, he came out there with his big mouth and stirring up things and, and people were thinking that Jewish American business owners were somehow uh, causing them to lose jobs in their local community and so people started rioting and they said, you know, two people turned up dead and the two people who turned up dead weren't even Jewish. I mean, it was, it was insane. 
Not that it matters that they were Jewish, and I'm just saying, but, 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 but two people were killed because the people who murdered them thought that they were Jewish and they thought they were somehow responsible for their economic deprivation because Mr. Sharpton helped stir that, stir that pot. So am I concerned that there's going to be some kind of riot or some type of uh, 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 outlashing, out a lashing out at this election? Absolutely, absolutely. Because too many people don't know the difference between perceived victimization and real victimization. Too many people are thinking that some, their destiny are in somebody else's hands instead of, instead of understanding that they are ultimately responsible for every step that they take. And it's not just black people. All you do is just look at this, uh, what they call themselves, occupate, uh, OWS. You know, you see these uh, middle class, <laughs> upper class white kids talking about the 1%. Are they crazy? Their parents got money. They out there marching. So you got some people who aren't working with a full deck. It can't be. If your, if your parents are making good money, you out there marching, talking about you part of the, you know, 99, I mean, something's wrong with your head. But so you, we got white kids, black kids, we got all types of young people out there. I'm really concerned. Yes, I'm concerned that uh, not if, but when the president loses this election. <laughs> Don't believe the media, y'all. Don't trust it. <laughs> Don't trust, I just want to say that. Don't trust the polls. All right, don't trust. Liberals have been controlling mass media forever. Don't trust it. People are tired of President Obama. Yeah. They're tired of him. I can tell you that right now. But I'm, I'm going to say this, though. I, I just got to get this off my chest. I heard Ms. Fleming mention the, uh, the debate, and I did watch the debate. I got to tell you something. I told the audience last night, I thought I was watching a white Muhammad Ali last night I went on that debate. Because <laughs> Mitt was dancing like, you know, like Ali, and he was just jabbing. Bam! You know. I mean, pow! Like, wow! I mean, let's face it. I'm gonna be honest with you. I was one of those people thinking, "Oh my God, I hope, I hope, Mr. I hope Mr. Romney can fight." And let's be honest. There's some of us that were concerned about whether he could put up a fight to the president. We were kind of concerned whether he'd be a little bit too docile. I'm one of those people. I'm gonna be honest with you. So I was pleasantly surprised and excited when he came out like Ali. You know, I'm like, wow! He was fleet-footed. I mean, she mentioned one of my favorite quotes. She said. Uh, when he said, Mr. President, you're entitled to own your own home and your own plane, but not your own facts. And the president, the only thing he did was... <laughs> like a little boy. That was beautiful. That was a work of art. I'm telling you, I stood up in my living room. I was at my brother's house with a bunch, you know, with liberals in the living room, you know, with my Obama must go t-shirt. <laughs> And, you know, I went to the Belton County Republican Party and got a Ryan Romney sign and brought it with me. Yeah. Hey, I go out to the Belly of the Beast. I don't care. Just don't put me on the cross. I'm good to go. I'm all right. That was a beautiful thing. And, and the thing it did, I, I think, more than anything, was it, it excited conservatives who weren't excited. Okay? A lot of conservatives, let's face it, a lot of us were like, okay, I'm going to go to vote home. I know. How many of you heard it? Let's be honest. I'm going to hold my nose, I'm going to vote. But some of them took their hands off their nose that night and said, you know what, I think we're working with something here. And I think the president underestimated what he was up against. And he got knocked out. And so now he's on the campaign trail talking about, I was tired. Now he's doing what he always does, lies. But I don't think that the American people are going to buy it this time. I don't think the, I don't think the American people are going to buy it this time. But we must not be complacent. Understand this, now, and I close. President Obama, from the time he was a young person, has been raised as a Marxist revolutionary. Understand that. From the time that he was a little boy, he's been introduced to concepts and ideologies that are inherently anti-American, that they, he sees America as this imperialistic nation. He believes in his heart of hearts, I think, that he's doing the right thing because he is not of the American mind. He wasn't raised with a perspective that was born out of the Western Hemisphere. So he came up thinking and being taught that America is the enemy. Capitalism is not the friend of freedom. He believes this stuff. So he's operating on a whole other level that most Americans can even begin to relate to. So do not underestimate 
this man. Do not underestimate the enemy. Do not underestimate what we're fighting against. Don't. You, I love the debate. I'm excited. It lets me know that Mr. Romney is definitely up to the fight. I was glad to see that. Now I'm relieved, and I can say, okay, let's, let's do it. He's, he's going to fight. Let's do it. But he needs us to go into these communities that are liberal leaning and help him fight. Are you ready to do that? So I'm in this right now. We have any more questions? All right, listen, it was an honor to be here, and I'm excited about Runaway Slave coming. Make sure you say hi to my friend CL when he gets here, and uh, make sure he gets some Texas barbecue, too, because I had some when I was done. It was pretty good stuff. And, uh, and most of all, now CL, I just want y'all to know, unlike me, CL has some boots. He's probably going to come up in here with some boots on. And uh, I'm going to leave here with some boots on. How about that? So God bless you, and thank you for all that you're doing. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, Jason Swim. Outstanding, Jason. Thank you very much. And oh, by the way, Stacy, Jesse here can, can get you a good pair of boots. You see those boots he's wearing? Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, that was great. Thank you. You know, Stacy told me he was going to preach. Stacy does not disappoint. Absolutely. Fantastic. It's good to see